Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we left off last time right on the precipice before the Tower of Babel. So we're going to uh, pick up with the Tower of Babel. Um, There is a specific shape to the Tower of Babel, and it is not unique to the Tower of Babel. Um, the shape is called a ziggurat, and they appear all over the weir- world, which is weird if you've never built a ziggurat. It's like, why did everyone <laughs> else get the memo, right? <laughs> uh, but Seems uh, like they're following a trend. Right. It, it, it means something, something important. I enjoyed the section of uh, Rushduni's book, um, mm. Rosas John Rushduni's The One and the Many where he's talking about ancient Mesopotamian religion Mm. um, and how the, the ziggurat or the pyramid in general, or even the mound, you know, Mm. it doesn't have to be super fancy. It's just this concept appears everywhere that man is always trying to ascend out of chaos into order. And that order always means somebody's deciding what happens, right? (laughs) There is Uh, an orderer. Mm-hmm. Someone at the top of a the specific pyramid. will, and wouldn't it be nice if that were me? <laughs> um, and that's a common feature throughout ancient religions in general. I think it's very odd to find any sort of exception to that rule that the one person at the top is the manifestation not only of order but of deity, because the two go hand in hand, do they not? Yes, the gods are reaching down, and we're reaching up, and where we meet, it's purely democratic, and we're all in this to get, no, usually sooner (laughs) or later, someone asserts himself in the name of the people, for the people, by the people, to be the spokesman for the people. And somehow, you know, sooner or later, he starts calling himself things like son of God, priest (laughs) king, emperor of the world. Things like that. In the so, uh, go ahead. It's so interesting, though, that in all of these things, they are they're an offshoot of the truth in the sense of the Lord using actual mountains. Mm, mm-hmm. And when you go up to the top of one of those structures, you are in a sense suspended between earth and heaven, as Christ was lifted up and suspended as the one true Son of God. Uh, it's just so interesting to see all the things they take, but then, of course, we misuse them in our sin um, to try to get to God rather than let God come to us. Yeah. So God initially creates the Garden of Eden on a mountaintop. We know that because there are rivers and they water flows downhill. Um, there's We can also think of Mount Sinai, but in each of these cases, God... God has come down in a sense. That's that's a major theme as well. So this man-made mountain, this man-made ascension, it's not that it's completely made up or wrong. It's just a a counterfeit. Mm. It's us trying to save ourselves. Yeah. Especially we see that with the artificial mountains. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're artificial. Artificial. It's right there in the name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and someone artificially steps in to help you the last little bit, which is, again, the person we were talking about who stands at the top Um, and says, I can help you span the little distance that's still there because you can't quite do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth meet in this one person where there is a mixture of the human and divine. And there, this may be something to say for much later down the line, but this is where Chalcedonian theology comes to bear in Christ. Mm -hmm. There is no mixture of the human divine. He's truly human, truly God. And yet the divine remains divine. The human remains human. In every other worldview, philosophy, religion, there's a mixture at that point. There's there's a continuity of being between what we think of as divine and what we think of as, well, mundane, this world, us. (laughs) And the goal is to climb and bypass the bottleneck and experience the fullness of divine presence, essence, and certainly power. And whether you're Pharaoh or 
Alexander or Caesar or some Aztec emperor or some... You um, might add in the Pope who stands oh, at the yes. top of that pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that one. I was going for um, Native American, indigenous ah. peoples, whatever we call them today. And uh, the the great many uh, American pyramid ziggurats and ritual mounds, as you said earlier. Uh, it has, uh, th there's a line in um, uh, Focus Pendulum where the two of the characters to the protagonist are debating the reality of um, occult conspiracy and such. And one of them puts forward, well, there are all of these pyramids everywhere. Why, do, why, do, why does everyone build pyramids? And the female protagonist says, because when you're in the desert, sand piles up in mountains, not in spheres. Hmm. Uh, Yes. However, <laughs> you could also you, you could also you know dig a ditch because the sand does that too. Uh, it's important in the uh, context of Genesis um, eleven to note the tail end of Genesis ten, which says, "These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues in their mm -hmm. lands and nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah for the generations." By these were the nations divided in the earth after their flood. Tongues, languages. Chapter 10 is the so-called table of nations that shows how humanity spread out across the planet, at least the first original 70 nations. And it said, and it ends, nearly ends with, oh, and they were divided by their languages. At which point our ears prick up and we say, languages? Where, Where do those, those come, come from? from? <laughs> and the whole earth was of one language. And so we have something that God introduced in Genesis 2 called the flashback. <laughs> where we said, oh, here we go. Let's find out where these language things came from. And we find out that originally humanity spoke one language, something, some kind of Proto-Hebrew apparently, judging by the fact that the names in Genesis 4 and 5 do mean something in Hebrew and not in any other language. Um, and so we wonder, well, well, why isn't that still the thing? Evolutionists struggle with the, the whole idea of where human speech came from in the first place. Mm -hmm. And their answer to multiple languages, as far as I understand it, is spread people out and give them enough time and language change. Well, that's true. Um, but it's also true that that's not what the history of when the linguistics actually shows us there are limited numbers of original languages and they all seem to more or less originate someplace oh in mesopotamia or thereabouts <laughs> How and, strange. and only a few thousand years back um not millions of years back or hundreds of thousands of years back uh, so this is exactly the kind of thing we should expect, but of course, evolutionists and secularists won't accept it because it involves two things. One, divine miracle. Two, divine judgment. And, you know, the last is worse than the first. The problem with miracles is they um, invoke a personal God who judges in history, and that's the danger. If God simply existed to poof in and out and do little nifties for us, we wouldn't be nearly as concerned about things like this. But mm -hmm. when we face a God who can, oh, destroy the world with a flood, and then we barely get up and running and are apostatizing again, and here he comes and smashes our languages and spreads the sauce across the planet, that's just not the kind of God we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and miracles have to, they necessarily involve judgment, as you say, but also in a simple moral judgment sense, not not even in a... Uh, final end of days, death yeah. kind of judgment, but because there's an intervention and there has to be a reason, a personal mm -hmm. volition to intervene. Otherwise it's magic, it's manipulation, it's push this, pull that lever and you right. get said result. In other words, co well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> covenant. God responds in terms of covenant. If we um, disobey his law, if we commit idolatry, if we invent gods, God is displeased and sooner or later, God intervenes. Now, God is incredibly patient. And thus the whole thing in Romans of why does it take God so long to act? 
Mm-hmm. Well, the goodness of God leads you to repentance or not. God gives man time to repent. He also gives us time to damn ourselves more thoroughly. The second commandment says that God punishes idolatry to the third and fourth generation of those who continue in that sin. So he doesn't, because uh, the judgment of God is not, what's the, the quote, is not cast as speedily, the hearts of men is fully set in them to do evil. Um, and, and so as we're, 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 this is good for our whole study of history. It, it's very easy, I find, in even when his, Christians are writing the history books, to forget the personal divine element. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we're fairly good in the Old Testament because we have God there telling us <laughs> that he's bringing down Babylon, he's bringing down Medo-Persia and all of that. But sometimes when we get past that, when we come into the New Testament, we forget that, that God still does that. And we fall back. And, and again, we, we were talking last time about common grace a bit. Often it's just thrown to common grace. Well, you know, there's ebb and flow, give and take, up and down. God has plans, no doubt, but they're too subtle for us ever to figure out. And we can't really say, for instance, that God flattened the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany because that's far too personal and to, <laughs> well, God tipping his hand. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so as we continue our study of history, we're going to assert sometimes that God did this. That God and he sure actually, did it through means. And he, he uses mm-hmm. means. Yeah, but um, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the means are other nations. Usually they mm-hmm. are. Occasionally they're, you know, asteroid strikes or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, or fire from heaven. Plague and pestilence. Plague and pestilence are good. But now drawing our attention back to here. So here's humanity. We're only a couple hundred years, give or take, I forget the exact number, um, into the new world. We have enough people to actually constitute a small city of some sort. And the the democratic element is very strong. Let us do this. Let us do that. Let us do that. From what scripture said back in chapter 10, there was this man named Nimrod. Um, I believe you said, Rachel, that he's listed as Nephilim. Is that correct? Uh, not Nephilim, but he it's the other word used for oh, the, the Nephilim, a mighty man before the Lord. Right. The, they call them a gibor in gibor, Hebrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is a word that can mean hero or... Um, conqueror. Conqueror, or someone who's very... Someone's great. Yeah, great this warrior. This is like David's mighty men <laughs> later on? Yeah. Okay. So it can have a positive or a negative connotation depending right. on how you use the mightiness. <laughs> uh, but the other side we will see here from the section on the Nephilim is that, again, they're concerned about establishing a name for themselves. Yeah. And so we've run into this this Nimrod, who is the son of Cush, who is the son of Ham. So we're not very far in, and we're told that the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, Babel. Mm. Uh, now, so whether he and his father, the, the traditions and legends seem to suggest they were ringleaders rather than actual tyrants who took over, because again, the democratic element, let us, let us. But just because there are people saying, let's all do this, does you not still mean have a there's leader. Not, yeah, there are still leaders. There are still people <laughs> yeah. pulling strings. There's still charismatic people stirring up the crowds. Uh, and when it all falls apart, Nimrod is apparently the one who steps in and takes over. The way that scripture mentions Nimrod suggests that everybody in the ancient world knew who he was. Uh, and we perhaps will have time to talk about him later when we start talking about the deification of the dead. But he was he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and that's not meant as a good thing. Uh, who or what he hunted? Did he hunt men? Did he hunt dragons? Did he somehow he made himself a reputation and was remembered well enough that when Genesis mentions him, the assumption is, and everybody knows who I'm talking about, so let's move on now. And the association of him with Babel was not in his favor, nor in Babel's favor. These were two headwaters of paganism that the the writer here is bringing together for us and, and to tell us, yeah, it started out as everybody had this great idea to build a community that would encompass the world and would be centered around this religious tower that would be a, a spiritual magical gateway to heaven. And out of it came this mighty man, this conqueror, who then proceeded to make the first post-flood empire. 
Uh, and it's at that point that secular history begins to overlap, and it takes a little bit of creativity to say, all right, so secular history doesn't know anybody by the name of Nimrod, but it does know some other people who sound an awful lot like him, and probably that's what they're remembering. There's a He's the founder, we're told, of Nineveh. We Well, historically, the name of that guy is called Ninus. Uh, he was... Um, the husband of the legendary Semiramis. <laughs> um, also, he's the founder of ACAD. Well, the first founder of ACAD was a man named Sargon. Sargon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these may all be the same person. It's it's hard to tell because the ancient world was really rotten at, re- at leaving um, historically accurate records of any sort. Largely, what we have are as the narrator in our town says, um, records of slave sales and grain sales and the conquerors boasting of who they conquered. But often these men were known by different names in different places. So when we're working this far back in history, the Bible is the one thing that's actually a historical record that's it's the only one that's trustworthy. So you're telling it's history, why are we still in the in Bible? to be a historical record, unlike yeah. what we have from the pagan world. Exactly. Well, because of what these people did here, God did alter something in the brains, and it was by family. It wasn't that you, shouldn't, you woke up and couldn't understand your wife. It was you couldn't understand your next door neighbor, perhaps. And, you know, when you can't understand people and you don't have Duolingo and time to process, <laughs> you, you, you get to the point where, and this is a new situation in our, our world here is Sacramento, or has been, Rachel's now living elsewhere. But, you know, you can go to Winco, that's a supermarket. And, it's um, a great supermarket. Yeah. And you can hear all <laughs> kinds of languages being spoken, depending mm-hmm. on what day of the week you go. Yeah. And we're used to that. And we, we learn a few simple words, and the cashiers learn a few more, and some of them actually have some other language as their first language. And we get by, because we're used to it, and we expect it, um, and we make an effort for the sake of largely living in peace and trading with one another profitably mm-hmm. to make this happen. Now, that, that happens to the world eventually, but the, the initial reaction is, I don't understand you. You are funny. You are speaking nonsense. I'm going over here. And over there, and further, and further. And we begin to get the beginning of, of nation states. Peoples who speak the same language among themselves, but don't speak the same language as anybody else. Although in some cases, the language differences are much more severe than they are in others. Uh, and so people began to move apart. Now, this is what God had told them initially, to be fruitful <laughs> and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, they hadn't wanted to. They wanted to stay together for the sake of self-protection against God, apparently. Mm -hmm. And God has his way. He spreads humanity out. And in terms of, again, our future look at at world history, some really practical things come of this that we need to consider. We're now going to have people spread out into different parts of the world, but the flood has rearranged geography and natural resources. This land will be a desert. This land will be high tundra. This land will be a forest. This land will be a rainforest. This land will be icy mountains. This land will be a beautiful, warm seashore. And they will all have their advantages and their assets. Some will have this mineral or that mineral. Some will have lumber. Some will have animals you can hunt. Some is great for crops. But nobody's going to have everything. Yeah. Even before the flood, we're told that one particular land had gold. Yeah. Right? At the beginning. Yeah. Good point. And so- have a lot. The gold of that is land is good. So that's, we're, we're creating this situation where my people group does not speak your language, but you are settled in a land that has something we want. <laughs> now, there's two ways to deal with this. <laughs> First, you walk in and take it. <laughs> <laughs> this that's is called, the hard way. <laughs> this is called war, and it's the hard way, and eventually we learn that. It would be easier if there was something we have too much of. Mm-hmm. And we find out you want it, and we want what you have, so let's kind of meet in between and or just send one of our guys over there with samples. And you know, that's a funny thing is that businessmen, traders, learn to get by the language barrier. It's one of the questions mm-hmm. I ask, I don't know, world history or econ or something, probably econ. 
what what makes world trade so difficult you know a b c or d and one of them is b language no it doesn't you you would <laughs> think but it doesn't cuz when people want stuff they find a way they hold up fingers and count yeah you point you hold up fingers far. yeah they do and then you start creating pigeon languages mm -hmm. pigeon english or pigeon french or something uh Hey, looky what I have you over here. -y. I, you know, <laughs> start insulting the intelligence of the locals and new languages come up because they figure that's how you talk because you do. Um, <laughs> and so trade develops. And and on on the right hand, maybe to say to the east, I'm trading for this good. But on the left hand to the west, uh, I'm trading this. And so I get your stuff, but. I, we're trading so much that we actually do, we're getting more from you than we actually need. Oh, but the people on the other side want it and they have something. With, and so one particular thing, like say silk from China mm -hmm. can make its way to the Roman empire without any central planning or <laughs> world government overseeing the process. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the miracle of free trade. Human greed. Now, it doesn't have to be greed. It can simply be human desire, and in which case we do all this nicely and with proper etiquette and respecting one another's boundaries and customs and all that. But even so, without that, we're, we're still sinners. We still want stuff. We want more stuff. We want more <laughs> senseless stuff, usually. And it just seems to work better most of the time if we trade rather than go to war for it. But humanity has been slow to learn that. And sometimes we think, well, but we want to be self-sufficient. So if we annex your country to ours, then we'll have ready access to all that stuff we've been trading for. So here's some of the economic background that goes into the next 4,000 years of human history. Uh, it begins now <clears throat> with God deliberately creating the situation where on the one hand, nations are coming into existence and posed to dislike each other, and yet because of scarcity are being forced to cooperate with each other. And as long as we're busy trading and, and it's successful, we're not as inclined to fight wars, but we're busy. And, <laughs> There's a you great know, line in the Mysterious Benedict Society mm, uh, very early on where it says the greed sometimes helps people find reasons to do the right thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, exactly. The free market must always remain free, I believe is one of Haley's quotes from that book. <laughs> the free market must be controlled. Yeah. Is a quote from that book. Okay. It's great. It's children's dystopia, but so cheerful and wholesome. It's the best thing. <laughs> it is best one of the better ones I've read. Yeah. Yeah. I have For to sure. read it. Haley keeps trying to get me to read it. And I keep... Well, and I, I, think think I, I think you will that, enjoy it very much. I think so. That might be a good place to insert here. The fact of what you're describing, Greg, is very decentralized and mm -hmm. individual, whereas what they were attempting in the Tower of Babel was a, a grand unity to protect yes. themselves and to get what they wanted mm -hmm. and to ignore God. And God says, no, actually, you uh, know that you need me more when you can't think that you depend on everybody else or some great system to catch you if something bad happens, which of course applies to many things today where <laughs> we attempt to systematize no. and bure mm -hmm. bureaucratize, can you say that? Bureaucracies, Bureaucracies. Bureaucracies. <laughs> uh, out of so many things, because if we can just have a system, if we can just have the right insurance, mm -hmm. we can be protected against all risk. <laughs> So that's what we have at the dawn of the new start, the new human history, the new beginning. We have a new world order. <laughs> Nothing new here. Nothing to see. Move on. And this will echo throughout the history of the world, throughout the Old Testament, on into our own time. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're seeing again in almost in archetype or in, in um, picture form, simplified form, what we still deal with, because here we have very few humans, relatively speaking, and yet these same patterns keep emerging and they're going to haunt the stage of history from here on out. So it's a, this is a good place to stop and look at them and say, ah, we're going to see a lot more of this, I bet. Yep, we are. Uh, we're going to keep seeing ziggurats and step towers and pyramids. And next week or the week after, we'll probably get to Egypt. 
So there's still a couple more things we need to talk about to bridge the gap into what's almost recorded history. <clears throat> because from the tower or from Noah to Abraham, there are 10 generations. And so just some general thoughts about what's happening there. First, humanity spreading out across the globe. The word globe here is important because although these 70 nations are all more or less within a stone's throw of Israel or where Israel will eventually be, they keep moving. They keep spreading. Um, family groups, you know what? Family groups don't get along much better than non-family groups do. <laughs> <clears throat> there are violent ruptures in family groups, and this group goes this way, and this group goes that way. I was going to say earlier when you were like, oh, it's not like a man woke up and couldn't understand his wife. I was like, that doesn't require a miracle. That happens every day. <laughs> yes. There <laughs> you is. don't need to speak different languages for right. that to still happen. <laughs> And I'm going to avoid so many jokes because I'm outnumbered <laughs> here, two females to one male. So we'll go on with this. Um, uh, we have humanity spreading out. So eventually, humanity reaches Australia, crosses the Bering Straits into the Americas, and ships. You know, Noah mm -hmm. had built a ship. <laughs> yeah, it's been done. He was it's a pretty good done. shipwright. He's a pretty good <laughs> shipwright. And so we can believe and assume that very early on, we have people not only traveling by ice bridges and land bridges, but by ships of various sorts. I mean, we have entire Pacific Island groups that have to be populated to, for people to be where they are today. And you don't get there by walking. The, the waters were never that low. So boats, ships of various sorts, navigation. Uh, and this is perhaps a point to remember again that Noah and his family came out of a technologically advanced world. How advanced? Can't be sure. But they built a boat half the size of the Queen Mary. So, you know, not slackers. We do have um, uh, Renaissance maps based on earlier maps, some of them apparently ancient maps, that show uh, the Americas, that show Antarctica ice free. Uh, somebody, someplace, sometime chartered a good place, good piece of the globe, and this very well may have been the time. Because if you're about to spread out, then it would be good to know what's out there. So this is going on, the the somewhat naive um, evolutionary idea of how humanity moved, well, Africa to Mesopotamia, across the land bridge into the Americas and so on. There is some truth in that. It didn't start in Africa, it started in Mesopotamia because the art set down in uh, the mountains of Ararat which is modern Armenia. But from there, Babel was Babylon, is in Mesopotamia, the meaning of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which was probably a little bit different where it is now because silt and the Persian Gulf growing and shrinking and all of that. But it was around there someplace. Something else that happened that's um, important and that uh, evolutionists are aware of after a fashion the floodwaters in receding left an imbalance of temperature. Hmm. And we have, the Bible does not mention it directly, although there are hints of it here and there, but we have cold. The earth is, is temperature-wise, it's imbalanced. And the ice of the poles of the North Pole particularly begin to grow and spread. And yes, there was this thing called an ice age. Um, were there more than one? Well, we're st we, we have ice ages on into the Middle Ages. Uh, they're just not that drastic. More but localized affairs. More localized. They, they, there was a time when there really was a Northwest Passage. You could get from the Atlantic to the Pacific by going above Canada and Alaska and around again. Um, that's not the way things are. Because you know what? Global temperatures change. <laughs> And uh, humanity has survived every temperature readjustment we've we've had to experience, including an ice age. So there's that. We acknowledge that it's there. Particularly the the one book that it's that's good to turn to at this point is one of the, with regard to topic matter at least, the it's one of the older books of scripture. And that's the book of Job. Mm -hmm. um, three things here in the book of Job that I'd like to point out. First, now we're in Palestine. 
in, in in southern Palestine. This is the land of Uz, which is more or less where Edom will be. Uh, this is chapter thirty-eight, and God's addressing Job, and He says something along these lines. This is verse 28. Hath the rain a father who hath begotten the drops of dew? This is chapter 38. This is chapter 38, verse 29. Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoarfrost of heaven who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Uh, There is a surprising amount of mention of snow and ice Mm -hmm. in a book that's set, well, what today is desert. It wasn't then. Canaan, once upon a time, was the garden, like the garden of the Lord, like the garden of Eden. Uh, Climate has altered over the centuries. But it's interesting that the deep is frozen. Uh, This is, they're, they're not living near the North Pole. They're living not far from the Mediterranean, and yet they can talk of the sea freezing over. So, the Bible acknowledges that something's going on there. When you start talking Ice Age, though, then you start coming up to, but wait, that's when there were cavemen, because we know <laughs> about that, because we've seen it in museums and children's picture books. And we know all about what cavemen look like. Well, what they look like, probably not, but were there people who lived in caves? Yeah, actually, you know, the Bible talks about that. This is chapter 30 of Job. And he's he's just told us how good the old days were when he was respected and treated well and had uh, prominence in the city and so on. And then in chapter 30, he says, But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Yea, where to might the strength of their hands profit me in whom old age was perished? For want and famine, they were solitary fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste, who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven forth from among men, they cried after them as after a thief, to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and in rocks. Among the bushes they brayed. Under the nettles they were gathered together. They were the children of fools, yea, the children of base men. They were viler than the earth, and now I am their song and their byword. So the caveman life seems to be a regression. It's is a regression the sense that I'm getting. <laughs> That's exactly it. They fled into the wilderness. Well, where were they before? In cities, <laughs> not in the wilderness. In not civilization. In, the, in civilization, <laughs> and when famine came or war came, want and famine, lack of food, either because poor crops or because of war burnt it all up, they fled into the wilderness. And they ended up eating roots and berries, hunters or gatherers, not Mm -hmm. even hunters. These are just people gathering mostly. Uh, And when they poked their nose back into civilization, people drove them out, sent them back (laughs) into the wilderness. And in time, they came to live in cliffs of the valleys, caves of the earth. See, cavemen. And this is interesting. Among the bushes, they braid. That's normally something an animal does, like a mm-hmm. donkey. That's a donkey sound. Yeah. they Their speech degenerated to the point that people couldn't understand what they were saying. Um, possibly they simply didn't understand amongst themselves very well because intelligent, philosophical, theological language was not high on their priority list. <laughs> now, we, of course, don't have cavemen today. We have under bridge dwellers and roadside dwellers and people in houses that otherwise seem closed dwellers. Uh, We have people like this. We call them homeless or whatever the proper politically correct term is these days. Uh, They had their homeless population. Their solution was to drive them out into the wilderness and they may do as best they could. I'm not recommending that that's a good idea. I'm just saying that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And so were there cavemen? Yeah, there were cavemen. At the same time, there were huge cities that were full of people and that preserved some level of technology. So we've got both of these things going at the same time. Um, And depending on where you might live, if you're living in the frozen Alps, that's not a great place to live. 
But if you're caught in between, you may end up having to stay there and find some caves to live in. Or if you're in some of the valleys of France, maybe caves would be a good place to uh, hang around, particularly while you're while you are hunting and chasing bison and such. So this this is a real thing. It's not a, a complete invention of evolutionists, but their mistake is to think that there's a progression here. There's mm -hmm. a regression. Civilization got off the boat with Noah, built within a, a couple hundred years, built a city at a tower um, that showed uh, keen mathematical understanding, and yet now it's falling apart. It's kind of the same mistake to make as is often made in the idea that people were shorter in yeah. recent mm -hmm. past centuries yeah. uh, because the clothing that we have that survived is smaller than people today and because the doorways in their houses right. were not so tall. When the reason the clothes we have are smaller is because they were children's clothes. They didn't get used <laughs> up. They didn't wear out. Mm -hmm. Those stuff that, you know, adults wore on a daily basis, we don't have as good yeah. preserved copies yeah. of. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, Just out of curiosity, the, the beds you... were shorter, but, uh, that's because people <laughs> slept sitting up. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't or, need the extra foot. <laughs> or cling, clinging around each other to stay warm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do with the doorways? The doorways are because, for. um, you don't have central heating. Ah, and so minimize so, the, uh, amount of airflow out. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, this was yeah. also reminding me of a misconception that as evolution comes on the scene in the 1800s, there's a lot of development of the idea of the noble savage. Mm. Mm. And so there is a certain element here where we see this as a bad thing to be going into nature. And yes. we see the way that it actually dehumanizes someone basically. But evolution picks up the other side and says, being in nature is our original and our purest state and thereby says, oh, yes, these cavemen that are where we come from. And so they see them as the beginning instead of a regression from um, something good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a distinction between a garden and a wilderness. They're both yes. very <laughs> naturey places, but there's one you want to be in. Yeah. Yeah. This one is not is, the nature you want to go back to. But I know. feel like there were probably people in the 1800 that thought living in a cave would be cool. <laughs> Climactically, it would be. Um, <laughs> Uh, we should, we, that seems like a good pausing point okay. um, before we go on to the deification of the dead. That's a teaser for next time. That um, and but, dinosaurs. And dinosaurs. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't get but, to that one yet. Yeah, yeah. We will talk about that next time. Uh, okay. But before we go, let's uh, sign off with some recommendations, which we forgot to do last week. So if you've sent us an angry email about it, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I have one. Um, there's a bookstore in Reading, or at least there was, I haven't been up there lately, called Cal's. And I got this book for a dollar uh, back in 08. Uh, you were quoting from uh, Dr. Russian, he's the one in the mini, one of the books he quotes. And by the way, in passing, breaking off one thought to pursue another, <laughs> and another off of that, is one good way to build a library is to look at the footnotes mm -hmm. of the scholarly books you read and find those books. Yes. That's what mm -hmm. I did here. I've done he, that a lot. He quotes um, a book called Before Philosophy. Mm. I was just it, looking at this. <laughs> it is a very scholarly book, but it's if you you got a college education, even a good high school education, you can read it easily enough. Uh, it's by multiple authors, Henry Frankfurt, his wife, John Wilson, and Thorkild Jacobson. Thorkild Jacobson gets to write the chapter on Mesopotamia. It's uh, called, well, Mesopotamia. And the three sections are the cosmos as a state, the function of the state, and the good life. As Sumer, Mesopotamia, Babylon, Assyria perceived it. Uh, the amazing thing to me is that I, I don't know that the author of that section is a Christian, but he does get one thing right. That he basically says that one thing that's indisputable is that all the religions of the world assumed a continuity of being between the divine and the human, except for Judaism, hmm. except for Israel. In Israel, God stood over against nature as something not to be identified with nature, and then he develops that thought in passing to a good extent. 
but most of it is how um, the people, the varied peoples of Mesopotamia from Sumer through uh, Assyria and Babylon conceived of the universe. And some of the things that you, that you mentioned already is this is one of the original um, scholarly studies of all that. So before philosophy, and the first author named is Henry with an I, Frankfurt. Henri. Henri? Okay. <laughs> I have anyway, a cousin named Henri. He's okay. French Canadian. That's my recommendation. Uh, Emily, I suppose we're supposed to go to you next. Yeah. Um, I want to recommend a kitchen tool that I didn't use until a couple of years ago. That mm. is a handheld blender or an emulsifier or an immersion blender. Apparently, oh, all yes. of those are the same thing. What? Uh, really? Yeah. I a no. handheld uh, blender was like the mixer that you hold. Yeah, or is that a handheld that's mixer? Like, that's a handheld mixer. Oh, <laughs> I think I always well, see use... my my wife has both. She has the the thing with the two little beaters, and yeah. she has a um, what you call Immer it, the immers immersion immersion blender. blender. Yeah, she has yeah. one of those. Or, I have yeah. both and, those too. I just didn't realize the difference in terminology. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why are you recommending great. this? Um, because it means you can make homemade mayonnaise, which is very very easy. Um, you can make baby food when Gretchen was little and couldn't eat a lot of things. We used this all the time. It was the happy baby food grinder and the immersion blender. <laughs> was, we didn't buy any baby food ever. It was great. Um, but what I did today with my immersion blender was make pesto. Mm, so pesto yeah. pasta sauce, just a ton of basil and cashews because I didn't have walnuts or pine nuts. Mm. And it was, it was super yummy. Mm, sounds great. To bring some to Bible study. <laughs> Happy baby food grinder. I can get behind that one. That's what most <laughs> of our girls were raised on. Yeah, it was so funny. Like, I think I think your wife, Kate, was yeah. the first person to recommend that to us. Yeah. And we we're like, that sounds really cool. We should get one. And then we we got one. It wasn't actually the Happy Baby brand. I don't know if that's still around. <laughs> it's not the one we found. We found yeah. Oxo. But anyway, it was just like, as soon as we had it, Everybody would spontaneously bring it up into conversation. Like, oh, you know, when my kids were little, I used yeah. the Happy Baby Food Grinder. <laughs> like, all right, I guess we're on to a good thing. Well, right. especially with the price of baby food and such. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Rachel, you. So my recommendation actually comes from something we talked about last week, uh, which was the uh, question of how civilization develops and the desire to create and all of that, uh, which I'm recommending the book called God's Battalions. Mm. Uh, it's by Rodney Stark. And yes. the reason I'm recommending it, most of it is actually about the Crusades, which you should also read his information there. Uh, but he has a couple of chapters that are dealing with the development of the populations under the Muslim rule, under the mm. um, empires of Islam from well, the 600s on. And one of the most important things I think he has is a chart that talks about how long it took for half the population to actually be converted to true Islam. And on mm. average, it was 200 to 250 years before 50% wow. of the population actually embraced Islam in most of the main countries. And so he then also spends some time on the development of culture and such. And even if it was a Muslim, why, you know, did Muslims never use it? Why did it end <laughs> up in Europe? Like algebra and algorithms that was, they were created by a Muslim Arab man, but they didn't ever use them. So we got them instead. Uh, but it's, the it's wealth a very, of the wicked is weighed up for the righteous. And it's pretty much that. So it's, it's interesting to see we assume, oh, Islam swept in and took over everything. And so everything is theirs. Uh, but it, it actually took a long time for people to truly embrace Islam. Mm. So hmm. that's where well, the time of the Crusades is a pivotal point because it's where the populations are really starting to flip towards Islam more so than they did before. Hmm. And I will add, yeah, I will add a general recommendation for Rodney Stark. He's mm -hmm. one of these, uh, uh, one of these guys we're seeing a good deal of who starts studying Christianity as an outsider and little by little <laughs> become convinced that there's something to all of this. Something's going uh, on here. Tom yeah, Holland, Jordan Peterson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Anyway, Rodney Stark is a sociologist as he's written a number of valuable books, including an introduction to sociology. This is a college textbook. Uh, but yeah, as he, the more he, he studied the effects of Christianity, the more pro-Christian he became. I don't know. I think he may have become a Christian. I don't 
I don't believe know that was the last thing I heard. But again, I know when I was reading about him, a lot of it was he loves Christianity. He thinks we're so cool. Um, yeah. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know where he has landed so far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll leave that between him and the Lord. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Um, thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed this show. Um, if you have, tell a friend about us. Um, we don't spend money on marketing, at <laughs> least so far. I very much doubt that will change in the future. <laughs> um, so tell a friend about us. Um, if you would like to get a hold of us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, and if you'd like to support us financially, you can visit our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash halting toward Zion. Big thank you to our, our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. You pay for good editing software that makes our life so much easier. You have no idea. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Um, if you'd like to get the transcripts of these episodes in your email inbox, you can subscribe to our Substack. Um, and a big thank you also to our transcriptionist. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks again for listening. 